Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, you've probably heard about the Russian engines that are being used on US rockets, most prominently the RD-180 that replaced the archaic stage and a half engines that were used on the Atlas III and, of course, went on to be the propulsion system for the Atlas V. And now we have the RD-181, which is on the Antares. Again, that is derived from the same engine series. These are actually both uh, kind of siblings of the RD-170 that was developed in the 1980s for the Energia and for the, the Zenit launch vehicle. But you might have wondered why these engines are used and what technical qualities makes them superior to the US designs and what engineering problems the Soviet scientists solved which the US didn't. Sure, there was that political decision to keep former Soviet rocket scientists hard at work after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but ignoring the political needs of the era, the engines are still arguably among the best in the world. Now, in the 1960s, US engineers, they began to focus their attentions, their rocket science, towards hydrogen-fueled engines. And this led to the amazingly efficient and amazingly expensive Space Shuttle main engine. The Soviet scientists, on the other hand, they continued to work to perfect the fuel cycles that they already had, squeezing more efficiency out of them by closing the combustion cycle. Now, a huge part of any rocket engine is the system that pumps the fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber. And any big rocket will have pumps driven by turbines powered by burning some of the propellant. In low efficiency designs, the gases that drive the pumps are then vented overboard, and this means a loss of thrust and efficiency. This is called an open cycle or gas generator engine. To make engines more efficient, the exhaust from the turbines can be piped into the main combustion chamber to generate even more thrust. And I have a whole video on rocket plumbing if you're interested in this in more detail. It's not as simple as just hooking the exhaust from the turbines into the combustion chamber because the combustion chamber will have a high pressure in it. And that then means that the pressure before you go into the turbines has to be higher still. And this makes things a lot more harder because you have to balance everything out. Also, the turbine materials can't handle the same high temperatures that we find in the combustion chambers because the uh, chemical reaction there is perfectly balanced to generate the right amount of energy. And that means that the turbines are generally driven by a fuel-rich or oxidizer-rich mixture so that you're getting less energy out of the gas than you would normally get. So in most open cycle rocket engines, they use a fuel-rich exhaust to drive the turbo pumps. And you can actually see the dark, dusty, sooty exhaust containing lots of unburned fuel. Or in the case of the F1 engine, you can see this as a dark curtain where the film cooling is protecting the nozzle from the heat of the combustion. So yeah, if you simply take this fuel-rich exhaust and then divert it into the combustion chamber, raising the pressure, then what happens is all those unburned molecules, they start to polymerize. They start to connect with each other and form a giant organic molecule, cornucopia, which loves to stick to the walls. Uh, and these will ruin your perfectly machined rocket engines. They will block cooling ducts. They will block injectors. They will attach themselves to the walls near the turbine and increase the friction. This process is called coking. And to be clear, these kind of reactions happen in regular uh, you know, fuel-rich exhaust, but when you raise the pressure and keep it around longer, it gives it more time and accelerates the process. One of the distinguishing features of RP1 versus plain old kerosene is there are some extra purification steps that go in to remove potential contaminants that can catalyze this process. So in the US, the engineers did develop closed cycle engines, but they use hydrogen and oxygen. So the fuel rich pre burner in that case is just full of lots of molecular hydrogen, which doesn't have the creativity that carbon does when forming molecules. Of course, there's another option to make lower temperature gases suitable for the turbo pump. Oxygen rich mixtures using a small amount of fuel and a whole lot of oxygen. And this means that there's no partially burned fuel hydrocarbons floating around in there. There is, however, lots of free oxygen looking for things to react with, like the metal structures of your engine. 
It's like an oxyacetylene torch, which cuts metal so effectively, not because that it's, ve it's very hot, but because there's a lot of free oxygen carrying away the metal, attacking it and destroying your nice uh, engines. So, the Soviet metallurgists in Samara, they managed to develop alloys for the engine which would be immune to the oxygen and still strong enough to handle the forces involved. And I'll admit that the exact details of this elude me, but I expect it's something like nickel, chromium, maybe some cobalt, with all sorts of other secret Soviet sauce in there. So the rocket engine cycle could be closed, and on the RD-180, all of the oxygen flows through the turbine, with a small amount of fuel added to provide energy. Then the rest of the fuel is introduced in the combustion chamber. Now flowing all of the liquid oxygen through the turbine, that means that you can run it as cold as possible, and then you're just turning up the amount of fuel until you get the temperature limits of your system. Really, you know, running cool just means it gives you more headroom to run your pump harder and faster. But ultimately, the end product in the engine, the most important thing is the specific impulse of the engine, which is about 10% higher than any other US kerosene engine. Even the Merlin engines that SpaceX uses with such great success, those are inferior to a decades old Soviet design when you measure it in terms of specific impulse. There's actually a documentary on this, it's called uh, The Engines That Came Out of the Cold, or it's also called Cosmodrome. And uh, yeah, it talks about how the earlier closed cycle engines were built for the N1 moon rocket, which, and it also has some great sound bites from US engineers stating that they didn't believe that this cycle was possible. And I'm not gonna dismiss the amazing work by the Soviet engineers, but I believe that this was really more uh, a result of the priorities of the US focusing on hydrogen and solving a whole lot of other impossible problems. Anyway, the deal to get the RD-180 on the Atlas also included the license for US manufacturers to build the design. But this ended up not happening. Instead, Aerojet is now developing the AR-1, which is a modern oxygen-rich staged combustion cycle engine. And this was a candidate for the main engine of uh, ULA's next generation rocket, the Vulcan. But the development doesn't seem to have proceeded as fast as many expected. And people think that the Vulcan might actually instead go with an alternative engine in the form of Blue Origin's BE-4 engine. That runs on liquid methane instead of uh, kerosene. And that doesn't have the coking problems that you get with kerosene. Now we'll find out who gets selected soon enough. Also elsewhere in the world, India and China have both developed their own oxygen-rich staged combustion cycle engines. Meanwhile, back in Russia, the engines aren't being used as much as you might expect. The Zenit rocket was actually manufactured in Ukraine and Russia is not buying any more of those. The Angara, is, uh, has been in development for something like 25 years and has flown twice and we expect maybe a handful of launches next year. That will use um, engines that are derived from this. But yeah, um, it's taken a very long time, although I hope this accelerates now that Roscosmos has publicly said they want to get rid of the Proton and replace it with the Angara. Regardless, the engines continue to be very good, and I'm sure they will have a future even after they're retired from US launch vehicles. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.